Oh, hey, Chris. Chuck, how are you? I'm really, really well. How are you? I am fine. I am just hoping that our audio is better than I know I have been bad in the last few weeks, and I'm trying to get better. Uh, we did a little uh, interview for the Plastics fella uh, for, his, uh, for his website, and I did mention that I've tried three different mics and three different laptops. <laughs> I can't figure it out. Well, you sound good today, and I know it's really frustrating. I, I must have gotten lucky because it seems to have worked out well with a really old pair of quality but old headphones and uh, my Mac Pro. Well, you know, that's how I would describe you, Chuck, quality but old. <laughs> but no, shout out, to, uh, shout out to Eric Zhu, our podcast intern who has stuck with us for so long, and, he, and hopefully, you know, he's able to make me sound a little bit better. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard work. And so, Eric, you got your work cut out for you, but uh, we appreciate all your efforts. So, Chuck, um, I have a nice little piece of feedback to get. I got an email from uh, Dr. Matthew Brown over, uh, he is a fellow in hand and wrist surgery in Wrightington in the UK. And he was kind enough to send me an email. Um, and he mentioned that as an orthopedic trained hand surgeon with a record of multidisciplinary education, I would be most grateful for your participation. He invited me to, to help with a talk at the IFSSH meeting. And he said he's a big fan of the Excellent Upper Hand podcast, which has simultaneously supported his recent hand diploma revision and made his weekly four-hour fellowship commutes between Edinburgh and Wrightington more enjoyable. He has highly recommended it to his UK colleagues. So another example of how we love our podcast community and clearly um, you know I'm, I'm flattered and honored at the opportunity to come speak uh, next June and I'm sure we'll be plugging that meeting as things come along too. Oh we will for sure it is going to be a great meeting and I've had a little insight um, especially onto the pediatric and congenital side I know the program is going to be strong. Um, I wonder if I'm going to get an invite to try to make you sound better at this meeting too I mean I don't know how you're going to do it without me. You know Chuck uh, you know the uh, you can keep following along on the bootstraps here. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll pull you along. I, I, <laughs> well, thank you. It. Thank you to Matt uh, for the email and, you know, your kind words and for telling everybody about the podcast. We're really excited uh, that it seems to really be uh, ha having a foothold. Yeah, we are grateful for all comments. And we've said this before and we'll say it again. The emails and the questions and the nice reviews really do provide fuel for us. Because while this is a labor of love, it is first a labor. Um, and it does require us finding the time to do this, even though we always have fun doing it, just trying to carve out that little bit of time. So thank you. Yes. And that actually brings us to our next uh, segment on the show. We're going to do a detail episode today. And I got out an email on the handpodcast at gmail.com account uh, from Dr. Colin Kennedy who kindly wrote to us saying that he is a hand surgeon in Las Vegas and wanted to let us both know how much he enjoys the deep dive episodes, found it educational to hear us go through common procedures step-by-step step and to discuss the nuances to the case and the techniques. It's a refreshing reminder to pay close attention to certain steps of the case that we may gloss over. Um, and certainly this is something where we have certain things that we pay attention to. Um, and these are the things that matter to us. And if you guys are listening to this episode or any of the other detail episodes and, and have techniques and pointers that you want to share with us, please, please email us and let us know. And Colin, thank you for that fantastic email. And I did respond uh, asking if there were any particular types of topics you wanted for deep dive. And he requested one of two topics, acute SL repairs, or drainage of flexor tenosynovitis. And I've heard, I actually encountered this drainage of flexor tenosynovitis on my most recent call. And a little birdie, Dr. Elizabeth Wall mentioned that you also encountered flexor teno on a recent call. So maybe we'll table that one as that memory may be a little too raw for now. And we'll talk about acute SL repairs. But here I am voluntarily presenting a sports topic to you, Chuck. Well, I, listen, I, I, while both are interesting, we should pick the more exciting topic, which is SL, and let's discuss that today. I, I do think uh, there are some pearls about the uh, flexor tenosynovitis drainage um, that I was, you know, it's just, it, for me, it was an example of why it is important for the attending uh, to be in the OR in the middle of the night uh, in cases like this, because hopefully and presumably there's always something we can teach. Um, and so it, those opportunities are important, but not the most glamorous of topics, let's be honest. 
Yes. I remember as a fellow here, Ryan Calfee, um, who is excellent about coming to every call case, um, always saying there's always something that, uh, that we can teach you. So, uh, and he taught me a lot. So um, there's certainly value in that. So we'll save Flex or Tino for another day, but let's do a deep dive, a Kobe style detail episode on technique for acute SL repair. So let me present a case to you. Uh, say you've got a 45 year old gentleman who had a fall onto his wrist about six weeks ago. Um, and he was seen by somebody else, was diagnosed with a wrist sprain. Uh, he comes in complaining of pain over the dorsal aspect of his wrist. Um, his uh, Watson test doesn't have any instability or clunking, but it certainly hurts when you do it. Um, there's no tenderness over his scaphoid proper, and there's no tenderness over his distal radius. His radiographs don't show any frank widening of the SL interval. They do show a little bit of DZ, a little bit of extension at the lunate, but no crazy, you know, uh, deformity, you know, no large increase in the SL ankle. So how do you approach that patient um, in terms of um, imaging? Um, and then let's talk a little bit about, or a lot about technique. Yeah, I'll start, I'm going to start and I'm going to hit on a couple of points that you made, which I think are really important. The first is the concept of pain, where it is, how long I may last after an injury like this and, and uh, how to use just your physical exam to differentiate possible etiology. So for me, uh, I use Lister's tubercle to start every examination of the wrist and I go about a centimeter distal to Lister's on the dorsal side of the wrist and you theoretically fall into a little valley. And that valley is the SL. And it is remarkable to me that outside of the initial trauma in a couple of days, people will really localize to the SL area, to the waist of the scaphoid, to the lunate itself. But you can pretty quickly figure out where the pain's coming from. So that's the first thing. Um, and I don't know if you think about it the same way, but I start with just trying to really localize the area of pain, uh, just distal to loose listers. Although let's be honest, it's six weeks, not everyone has pain. Um, but in this patient, still with pain. So do you think about it the same way as far as your exam goes? I do, but uh, we were told in the very beginning that we didn't disagree enough. I actually go to the, the area where I think it's going to be most painful last, because once I've pushed on that area, I tend to lose some sensitivity of other portions of my examination. So I wouldn't start there. I would probably go there last, but I agree 100% otherwise. Yeah, very true. And then the second you're, thing, you're just, you're just mean and you just want to jam on people and <laughs> cause them pain. So that's fine. Get, get their respect early. Um, the, the second thing is the shift test. And I do it every time um, described by Kirk Watson. There's different ways to do it, but I do it a classic, classic way. And I don't know how good it is. You know, certainly there are times when the patient responds with discomfort if they're not guarding um, and it can make me feel better. Uh, other times I do it, I don't get much feedback, maybe because the patient is guarding. But for me, that's not a be all and end all test. How do you think about the Watson scaphoid shift test? Um, you know, I think that uh, it's a useful test. I always do it. Um, I, I, I think you very rarely see the findings that Watson described and it's classic, you know, you're going to feel um, an actual shift or a clunk as the scaphoid reduces back as you let go of your thumb. Um, because when you're what you know, for that maneuver, it's very hard to demonstrate to talk through the maneuver. Um, but, you know, with your thumb being on the, the distal pole, kind of on the palmar surface of the of the wrist, as you go from ulnar deviation and extension into flexion and radial devi deviation, what you're trying to do is subluxate that um, uh, subluxate that proximal pole of the scaphoid out of the scaphoid fossa. And as you let go of your thumb, in the setting of a uh, complete SL tear in which the scaphoid is adopting a flexed posture, that scaphoid should clunk back in to the scaphoid fossa. And I very rarely will see that, but it, I, I find it to be helpful because there's a little bit of a shift, it moves a little bit or it causes a lot of pain. Yeah, again, hard to do on, over a podcast, but let me add a few points to that. So. The first is that you are pushing on the scaphoid tuberosity at the base of the thumb. And if the patient has pain there, that's not a positive test. Uh, you are looking for pain and theoretically a clunk dorsally over the SL. And as you said, when you go from ulnar deviation where the scaphoid should be extended to radial deviation where the scaphoid should be flexed, 
initially your thumb is preventing the scaphoid from flexing uh, and maybe pushing it out over the back. And so you may get a clunk there, you may get a clunk when you let go. Um, but I think it's a helpful test. It's just not all that reliable for me. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's useful to go through it with the trainees, the, the you know, the, the theory and the kinematics behind it as to why it should theoretically be positive, because that reinforces this concept of the, in the setting of an SL tear um, of the scaphoid wanting to flex. And then your next question is around imaging. And so for me, a, scapho, uh, a scapholunate series is a little different radiographically than a scaphoid series, but a scapholunate series is a PA radiograph, a lateral radiograph, an ulnar deviation radiograph, and a supinated grip view. Um, and those hopefully give me information. And the supinated grip, we usually do bilaterally on the same x-ray plate to compare the gap. And sometimes I'll do a live C-arm, which can be helpful as well. It sounds like in this case, there wasn't major widening of the SL, which often is present, but it, that we can get to the secondary stabilizer issue. But, but even if there's a complete SL tear, you don't always have immediate widening. So do you use the ulnar deviation view to help you understand the correctability of the scaphoid? Say that it is, you know, say not in this particular case, but you have a flex down scaphoid. Um, do you use that only deviation view to say, okay, I, I think I can get this one back. Or if it doesn't budge on an only deviation view, do you say there's no way we're going to get this scaphoid to sit up into a neutral posture? I do use it for that reason. Um, and I do just get, it gives a great view of the scaphoid itself, obviously, because it's extended, but if it doesn't extend as much as you might want, that's a, that's a secondary signal of a problem, uh, because it really is that lunate and triquetrum, which bring it into extension. So with a complete tear, it may not extend as much. And yeah, I mean, if it doesn't want to extend, it does raise alarm bells, although usually I think you can get it back into position. Uh, but at six weeks, as you mentioned, we're not terribly worried about our ability to correct this uh, if we end up going to the operating room for a scaphoid ligament injury. So I want to spend the majority of our time on the technique parts of it, but just a brief word about imaging, always an arthrogram for you in this setting? I'm, I'm, I'm changing a little bit. Yes, I think an arthrogram for most of us is the right way to go, even though patients don't love it, um, because it's just so good when you have a potential ligament injury to see that uh, contrast flow from the radiocarpal joint to the midcarpal joint. Uh, but a really good MRI, you know, like a three Tesla machine with good radiologist, often you don't need it, but I think it's safer still in 2021 for most of us to order the arthrogram. Yeah, I, can, I was fortunate enough in residency to have trained at a place that did beautiful wrist MRIs. Um, and I remember coming here and fellowship being, like, oh, do we need an arthrogram? And you're like, of course you need an arthrogram. I'm like, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sir. I will never question you again on the need for an arthrogram. <laughs> yeah, but it's fair. I mean, it really does depend on your imaging capabilities. And we, you know, we're very fortunate at WashU. Um, I don't know if there's a huge difference between the imaging quality here versus uh, your Mecca, but, uh, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with ordering an arthrogram. Indeed. So I will say now at this point, say we've decided that, um, we're going to go to the operating room. So this patient's MR arthrogram came back with a full thickness SL tear. Um, and he's a young person. He's 45. So even younger than you, Chuck. And very young, very young. <laughs> Now the time frame gives me pause, and I intentionally made it six weeks. So, what do you think? Can you repair a ligament at six weeks? Can you repair a ligament at three months? When can you no longer repair an SL ligament? So, first of all, for those still learning about the scaphoid ligament, you know it's a C-shaped ligament, uh, dorsal, proximal, and volar. Uh, there's nothing distally, and we always talk about the dorsal scaphoid ligament being the key portion. And when I think about it, you know, if we're like in the lab or if we're excising uh, an injured scaphoid to do a four bone fusion or whatever, if you're trying to cut through that scaphoid ligament, especially dorsally, it's not easy. It's a stout ligament, especially dorsally, where you really need a sharp knife to get through it. However, when you are repairing it, it seems ridiculously difficult to do that. It seems thin, it's unimpressive. And trying to stitch that ligament back together is tough. So that's what I'll start with. I want to say one more thing. And that is six weeks is really important. 
Um, and I know you didn't pick that number uh, arbitrarily. Um, historically speaking, uh, we would either say you have three weeks to repair an SL ligament or else forget about it, or you have six weeks to repair uh, an SL ligament. Um, and after that, you're not getting it. And so forget about it, proceed to a salvage procedure. Like literally, that's what we would say. So proceed to a scapegoat excision and form of fusion. In 2021, I think most of us would not proceed to a salvage procedure. We would think about a repair or repair plus. Yeah, so, you know, I think that uh, the repair plus is the interesting part. And we've talked a little bit about on the Never Have I Ever episode about procedures that are published, but we probably wouldn't do. And one of those was the 3LT, the three ligament tenodesis. But that is a reconstruction procedure um, that stops shy of the salvages, the four corners, the PRCs, that kind of thing. Um, because we're assuming in this case, when I'm telling you, since it's a case I'm presenting, no arthritis. Um, and we're trying to prevent that formation of slack wrist, you know, the predictable pattern of arthritis that occurs with SL incompetence. Now, I will say nobody knows, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you are in this world much more than I am, but nobody really knows the time frame, how long it takes to get a slack wrist after an SL tear, but we know that it eventually occurs. Yeah, what we know is that the flexed position of the scaphoid eventually leads to arthritis of undetermined time. And that likely is, in my humble opinion, uh, that likely is related to the exact injury experienced. And so do is the tear only of the SL proper or are the accessory ligaments injured? Because eventually, if the accessory ligaments are not injured, eventually they will fail over time and that scaphoid will truly flex and you get arthritis. Um, and so I think it can be five years, it can be 20 years. So it's really unpredictable, but we've all seen, uh, well, you and I have seen uh, that patient who comes in with no recollection of injury, that dorsal radial swelling, and you know the diagnosis before you get the x-ray, which is a slack wrist. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, we don't have all the answers and that, that, that uh, Brunelli type reconstruction is certainly the choice of many. And this patient would be a candidate for that, honestly, because repair is just so, so unsatisfying. So let's change one important caveat here. Say it's two weeks. Um, patient has come to you for the original injury and an original assessment. You're in the OR. Do you find that that ligament is often ruptured mid-substance between the scaphoid and the lunate? Do you find that it is often come off of the scaphoid more or come off of the lunate? And then how do you talk me through how you would technically do this repair? Um, yes. So I, I think it can be either. My most recent event was a perilunate that I repaired a couple of days later on my elective day. Um, and in that case, the ligament is uh, most commonly torn off the lunate. Certainly, that was my experience a couple of days ago. Um, I think, however, often the ligament remains on the lunate and is torn off the scaphoid, uh, especially in an isolated SL. Um, so my goal is an anatomical reduction of the carpus. And it's more than the SL, but it's an anatomic reduction of the scaphoid and the lunate with considerations for the capitate. And I would say traditionally, I've done that with K-wire fixation, and then as good a repair as I can do of the dorsal SL. And this is where I get to my disappointment. Um, and this is, this is why I think these fail, is that you know, we are hoping that we can get an intraarticular ligament bathed in synovial fluid to heal with a suture anchor and a little horizontal mattress suture. It's just not a ligament that is amenable to a good repair and I don't think to healing, but hopefully enough scar tissue forms to prevent problems down the road. That's honestly how I think about it, whether it's two weeks or six weeks, or whether it's an immediate repair with a perilunate. Uh, I just don't think that ligament lends itself to repair. So let's, you made a couple of really interesting points that I think we should elaborate on, given that this is a detail episode. So you mentioned getting an anatomical reduction. How do you do that? I know that you're, you know, if you're going to talk about joysticks and, you know, K-wire fixation, what size K-wires do you use for the joysticks? What size K-wires do you use for the fixation? Are they percutaneous? Are you leaving them out? Are you cutting them and burying them underneath the skin? Where are the wires going? So the first question is, if we are going to use K-wires for fixation and try to do a repair, um, then... 
God, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so joy, joysticks. So, yeah. well, if we're going to use K wires for fixation um, and not something like an internal brace, which we can talk about, which may have a role here, um, then um, we are going for the anatomical reduction as judged by direct visualization of the scapholunate interval and you know x-ray in the operating room. And so I use 6-2K wires as joysticks. Um, and so typically you're taking the lunate out of extension into flexion, bringing the scaphoid out of flexion into extension and often overextending it slightly to make your SL angle 30 degrees, 35, 40 degrees, something like that. And then I'm my first K wire. So my first K wire will be from the distal scaphoid to the capitate to hold the scaphoid in general where I want. And then I use the, uh, after having used the joysticks to hold things generally together, the second K wires from the scaphoid to the lunate. I found this to be much more gratifying to correct the SL angle as opposed to correcting the actual gap. Does the gap matter? I think the gap does matter for the theoretical um, ability to repair the ligament because you need it in close apposition, if not over reduced slightly to have any chance of getting that ligament to heal. So how do technically, how do you manage the gap? I've seen people kind of take those joysticks and cross them almost to hold it together and maybe use a big coker or something like that to keep it held depending on, you know, number of people you have assisting you, et cetera. Yeah, I like, I like the concept. So, um, I'll tell you what I haven't been overly successful with is trying to use like towel clips to apply a compression force. For me, I've been really happy with 6-2 K wires. And you have to be careful how you place your 6-2 K wires because they can get in the way of other things like your suture anchor. And some people will put their suture anchor in first and then put the 6-2 K wire in. So, so you want that anchor placed appropriately. Uh, but if you have your K wire joysticks in place, and you do the reduction mover from a dorsal volar standpoint, and then you cross your hands, I, I, it, for a mobile scaphoid, it's really effective in reducing, or like I said, even over reducing the interval slightly. Is that how you do it? Yeah, and I think that the joystick placement is super important. So you mentioned oftentimes that you're, um, you need the joysticks to be out of the way of other things like your fixation K wires and your anchors. So it's important to think about where you're going to put those things. And then you're correcting the lunate from being an extension. So you want to make sure that when you put in your wire, you're a little more proximal on the lunate so that you have room to correct the extension and flex the lunate. Excuse me. Yeah, correct it and flex it into the anatomic neutral position. And then vice versa for the scaphoid so that you have room to extend the scaphoid. So you're almost dropping those wires in at different angles to correct them so that they sit next to each other. And then you can bring your hands across, like you mentioned. Um, so I think about it the same way. Do you use six, two wires or four fives for the joysticks? For the joysticks, I use six, two for the pins that I put in, I use 0 0.045 K wires. And I do tend to bury those. If I use them, I, I will be honest that at the six week interval, I'm probably thinking about an internal brace and no K wires whatsoever. Um, but if I'm going to put in K wires, I use four fives and I bury them. What do you do? Um, I will use six twos for all of it. And I typically will bury them if I am using K wires. And I probably have a, a, a lower threshold to use K wires than you, um, since I probably do less sports surgery and I have less familiarity with kind of the comfort levels of you know when to let people move things than, than you are. Um, now you mentioned one thing that the scaphoid, that you can get the reduction. What do you do if you can't extend the scaphoid? If you really can't extend the scaphoid because of scar tissue, again, that would be a longer interval than six weeks. Then I think you either have to do a sharp release of scar tissue, typically at the volar, uh, distal aspect of the scaphoid, um, or at the ST joint, scaphotrapezial joint. Um, but in my experience, it's just been really rare that that is required, but I think you have to be prepared. Likewise, you know, most of the time you have to be prepared to do a salvage procedure if you're doing something at six, you know, three months or six months. I don't, I think it's foolish to just tell the patient to go do a scaphoid repair because it may not be possible. And so this is one of the situations where preparation really matters. One oh, other, I, oh, go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. 
that was to say the uh, I, I like using in the office and um, using the live fluoro to get the um, the, uh, the owner deviation view so that I can prepare myself and prepare the patient for what we are likely to encounter. Um, and then I know we're going to save SL reconstruction for a different detail episode. Um, so I will ask you, you know, what kinds of anchors are you using relative size and manufacturer, if you want to say, and what kind of sutures are loaded in those anchors? How many anchors are you using? Where are you placing them? Yeah, again, it gets to the point of what are you really accomplishing with these anchors and with the, uh, with the suture, because it's not a strength repair. Your, the goal here is simply to get a close reapproximation of the anatomy and have that ligament laying back in place, laid, laying, put back in place. And um, I use a uh, typically a 2.7 corkscrew anchor with a 2.0 uh, fiber wire ethabon type suture. Uh, I happen to use Arthrex, as, as we all know, it doesn't matter what anchor you're using, I'm not conflicted. Um, so that is, that's my approach. And I put one anchor in, and I try to do a little horizontal mattress. I, I, I've tried to do a little crack out type suture. It doesn't work um, to get that, to get that, again, the ligament to lay nicely back in place to give it the chance to heal. Now that's a mini size type, basically anchor. Yeah. Mini, mini, mini anchor of some sort. Yep. Got it. And, and carefully positioned to keep it out of the joint, whether that be the mid carpal joint or the SL joint uh, right at the edge of the articular cartilage. Well, so, I mean, taking other orthopedic lessons of repairing, ligaments back down to bone what do you think about like a double row like why not another anchor because <laughs> i don't think it adds anything i think all you're adding is the strength of the suture which gets to the reconstructive concepts and gets to the internal brace i think one of the interesting things that i struggle with that i'm certainly far and away not the first is that okay so let's say you do have that isolated sl injury as we do an open approach to the scaphalonate ligament we are cutting secondary stabilizers, assuming they hadn't been injured with the injury. And so that's why the ligament sparing approach, for example, was developed. I, I think it was developed at Mayo, but certainly the Mayo guys use it. Um, and so that's, that's fundamentally problematic. And that's why people uh, like PC Ho, who does really great work arthroscopically, have described arthroscopic repair techniques, not in an attempt to have technology triumph over reason, but really to preserve those secondary stabilizers, which makes a lot of sense. I'm just not yet convinced that I can effectively perform an arthroscopic repair, much less a reconstruction of the SL interval. And so I typically do an open approach. I will consider a ligament sparing approach. And if I'm not able to do a ligament sparing approach because of access, then I just make sure I do a really as good as possible repair of the dorsal capsule when I close. So when you do your approach, when you don't do a ligament sparing approach, are you doing the standard kind of inverted T dorsal capsulotomy? I am. I actually just make a straight line capsulotomy. Okay. So just for, for all of those dorsal incision, um, thankfully, you know, you're not really encompassing any, any nerves typically in this, in the midline, right over the third compartment, uh, open the third compartment. I go ahead and transpose the EPL. Uh, I leave the EPL transposed when I close and I, I close retinaculum beneath it. And then I'm working between the second and fourth compartments. So I incise the uh, capsule longitudinally, if that's my approach for the day. Uh, and I, as minimally as possible, take the capsule off the radius. Uh, and then you have great exposure. It does simplify your repair. There is no doubt. I am not one, work a little nerve into this. I'm not one who routinely performs a posterior osseous nerve neurectomy. I want to hear if you do. Um, and then do the repair. I close well, and I'm done. What do you What do you think about that posterior osseous nerve? I don't do the neurectomy, although I, I see the argument. I know that Dr. Rob Gray is going to tell me that I should be doing it every time. Thanks, Rob. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I guess I could be convinced, but I feel like there is enough literature out there suggesting that that has a proprioceptive function, and we're trying to preserve the native or restore the native anatomy. And I think there's probably more sense in keeping it in this particular case. And I'd feel differently if we were doing obviously some kind of salvage procedure. Um, and I guess, you know, the question I have for you, just little technical things, how much extensor retinaculum do you feel like you have to divide um, in order to get your access to the depth you need between the second and fourth compartments? You mentioned opening up a portion of it to transpose the EPL out. Are you taking down all of the extensor retinaculum, you know, just a distal quarter, third, something like that? 
I think you can do it either way. I tend to just open the third compartment and transpose the EPL. I think you could also leave the EPL where it sits, not transpose it and work distal to it. I just think it can be a, it can be a little more of a futz factor. And I think if you're, if you're going for a big exposure, go for the big exposure. The, now, Anilus, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, sorry, I was just going to say, you know, I think there are some reasons like an arthritis procedure where taking out the posterior osseous nerve makes all the sense in the world because I don't think it really matters for the future. I do think there's a component of dynamic stability provided by some would say the FCR especially or, or the radial wristic sensors. And so to me, even though I don't think it's been proven conclusively, I think that posterior osseous nerve innervating the capsule does provide some of that potential, which is why I don't take it out. Yeah, Elizabeth Hoggart in, um, in Sweden has done a lot of work on this and has convinced me that I think that it's important. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the things about, for example, like an ACL reconstruction never feels normal because you don't have the normal proprioceptive fibers of the ACL. But again, I'm kind of, uh, I'm not particularly well-versed on this. I don't feel very strongly about it. It's probably the only thing in nerve that I don't feel strongly about. I will second that. Not that I, I don't feel strongly about any of them. Second it for you. So how long do you leave your pens in and do you bury them or no? So I will leave them in as long as they'll let me stay in, to be very honest with you. I shoot for six weeks. Um, Depending on the patient, most patients I leave them, um, I leave them out of the skin. Um, I don't like coming back to the operating room if I don't have to. I know we have partners who will remove buried pins in the office. Um, I'm game for pretty much anything in the office, but usually not that. Like, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a little bloodier than I like. I agree with that. I, I do go a little longer. So for a, an isolated SL, I will shoot for eight weeks and perhaps 10 weeks. And when I get to that duration, I typically do bury them. Uh, yeah. if, I, if I do a really good job, then the pens are deep enough not to bother the patient, but easily palpable. And I will consider an office removal if the patient would like. Uh, otherwise, I come back to the aura, which I think is a terrible waste of resources. So how, um, how long do you think pins exterior to the skin will typically last? Do you think you'll, you, you've mentioned you probably can't get eight to 10 weeks out of them. Do you think you can get six weeks out of them? Yes. I think if I was planning to leave them for six weeks, uh, for most patients, I would put them external to the skin. And it, you know, it's patient dependent and it's the quality of the cast dependent because I think it's the, the wiggling. It's also the putting the pens without tension on the skin. And so really doing a generous release around the pens can be helpful to mitigate pen site irritability, which leads to a lot of the problems. So when you're burying the pins, um, do you make a healthy incision to, um, you know, and, and given that you're on the radial side of the wrist, do you find the SRN or anything like that? I do. Um, so a little incision right at the level of the styloid and just distal to it, because that's where you want to be, whether your pen is going proximal towards the lunate or distal towards the uh, distal capitate, that's where you want to be. So incision, uh, little Ragnall retractors, uh, just to protect the sensory nerve, and then you're down on bone. So it's a nice, it's a small incision, but uh, it's effective and it kind of protects the, uh, against uh, tertiary damage. Now, do you, do you make that incision before or after you fire the pins? Before, I, I actually make the incision and then place my pins. And then, and then I make sure, and then I make sure that once we're all said and done, that the pins are not, if I'm leaving them out, leaving them in, I just make sure they're not causing irritation of the skin. And just one, six, two across the SL, I've seen, you know, some people use two, four, fives across the SL, or you said one, you're using four, fives for that fixation. Um, so just one, not using two for rotational stability. Yeah. I think if you have a pen going into the capitate and a pen going from the scaphoid to lunate, one is sufficient. Uh, I'm certainly not against two. I just don't think it's necessary. And then one other technical thing that, um, you know, I, when I, before I got here, um, I had seen these repaired with two anchors and then double loading an extra suture through the anchor. I remember talking to you about that and you just kind of saying that uh, that was not your preference. Uh, <laughs> probably different to a different way, um, but because you, you wouldn't believe that that would make a difference and, and probably is just more foreign material um, holding things in place as opposed to encouraging biology. Yeah, listen, I mean, I think very few people would disagree with the statement that the scaphalonate ligament injury remains the biggest unsolved problem in hand surgery. And it is kind of sad to say, we've been saying it for 30 years. 
and it remains unsolved. And there are, you know, there are different ways to get around this problem and maybe get through, get through this injury for patients with different techniques. But every single hand surgeon has his or her own philosophy on what they need to do with pen placement, with anchor placement, with double loading of anchors. It's very frustrating, but when there's 100 choices, it's because there's no clear winner. So let's say we'll leave the suture tape augmentation for a different day. Um, but let's say that you have these K-wires, you've removed the K-wires. What's your protocol? Just bring us to a close with your protocol for rehab. Yeah, so let's say we get to eight weeks. So eight weeks, patient comes back, the pens are slightly palpable beneath the skin. We can successfully nick the skin and take out the K-wires. Um, then we send the patient to therapy for a, a volar forearm thumb spike, a splint. Um, and we start with active motion um, and gentle passive motion. At two additional weeks, we'll go more aggressively with the passive motion. And at 12 weeks, I go to strengthening. How do you think about it? Pretty similar, not, uh, not anything different. Um, I just know that we have a lot of therapy colleagues. If you have seen very different protocols that you found to be beneficial, certainly let us know. Um, and we'd love to share it. Yeah, we've tried in our group to standardize our therapy protocols. We've talked about it a million times. We have wonderful therapy partners at Millican Hand Center. And we are pretty uniform. We're not always exactly the same, but we've tried just to, for many reasons, it makes sense. One, it's just more applicable. Uh, two, there's more opportunity for research uh, if we are standardized with our protocols. Uh, and three, it's just easier. Um, so I think we're generally pretty uniform because none of us dig in too much on this. If someone has a strong opinion, we go with it. And we defer to our therapy colleagues who kind of see things in action. Um, yeah, so I'm a little, I'm, most of my practice is a little bit away from Millican. I'm fortunate enough to work with the Athletico group a fair bit, and I've tried to adopt those protocols. One thing I like that we haven't mentioned that we should before we finish is dart throwers. So what do you think? Can you initiate earlier motion with dart throwers? Maybe you don't even have pins in, but you know, um, can you start things earlier in that plane? I, I buy the concept. And if you want to describe it, you may be able to do it better than I. It's simply the, the dorsal radial to volar ulnar uh, motion, uh, I believe. And uh, it's theoretically putting less stress on the SL interval, but we don't routinely use it. Um, there's literature out of New York, as you are well aware, to support it. It's not been a principle of our rehabilitation protocols. Little secret, I really like it and I use it. <laughs> so I'm a little further away and I guess I can't be in your, your huge uh, Chuck Goldfarb, uh, Lindley Wall, Ryan Calfee, Marty Boyer, Dave Brogan study of SL injuries. You are not welcome. <laughs> I like the dart throwers. It makes sense to me. I obviously trained with Scott Wolf, who spent a lot of time with, uh, uh, with Trey Crisco on that um, idea. I think it makes absolute sense. Um, it's just a matter of whether it's being implemented appropriately and understood by the patient. And that's where I trust our therapy colleagues to help reinforce that. But I do like dart throwers. I, I think it, um, it allows me some element of confidence that my repair uh, or reconstruction in a different case is not going to be excessively stressed, um, but starting the patient on some rehab a little bit earlier on. Look, I would never argue against it. I just hadn't chosen to implement it. But uh, again, that's where some of the variability comes in, which is the, the spice of life, unfortunately. Well, maybe one day we can teach an old dog new tricks, Chuck. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I, I'm always happy to learn a new trick. Uh, all right. Well, this is good. We do have, we can do follow-ups on this as well, but we appreciate the, the listener request and hopefully we've satisfied, we've scratched that itch and uh, send more, send more opportunities our way. Yeah. Colin, thank you for that suggestion. Hopefully uh, this, um, this helped you out uh, as much as it helped us thinking about it. Um, and then honestly, if anybody has any other topics they want, we've gotten a lot of really good reception for the, the detail episodes. So if you want more deep dives, tell us what you want to talk about and we'll try to work it in. Yeah, and I, I would say most importantly, we love your comments. And um, on Twitter, when Chris tweets about this episode, I am sure that some of you are going to comment on your approach. Please do. We don't claim to have the, all the answers. We have some of the answers. We don't have all the answers. So comment. Yeah, well, in the last episode, Chuck bragged about uh, the reach of the podcast and how nobody else could ever top this podcast. <laughs> so he thinks he has a lot of the answers. So please prove him wrong. Please prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. All right. Have a good day. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.